Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revit Pure Live. I am your host, Nicolas Quetelier. I am an architect, a BIM specialist, and the founder of the website RivetPure.com. We've got a very special guest for you today. Uh, but before moving on to the guest, a couple of things. Well, first, already uh, having a look at the chat, seeing where everyone are from. We have people from Nigeria, Sweden, Kansas City, New Zealand, uh, Mexico, Uruguay, Kentucky, Vancouver, and Boston. Uh, so keep saying where you're from. It's always interesting to know. And today's episode is sponsored by Avail, but actually we've got Avail CEO on the line. So I'll skip the little demo because we'll have to we'll get to talk about it for uh, for a while. And a couple of things to announce. Um, there's no episode next week, nor the week after. The next episode of Revit Pure Live will be on March 23rd with uh, Jens Majdal Kalsham, who is the design technology leader at BIG, one of the most famous architecture firm in the world. And we'll get to talk about everything BIM at BIG. I think this will be a fascinating episode. I'm a pretty big fan of BIG. I've been a big fan since my college, college days. Really looking forward to this episode. So, so it is three weeks from now. We're taking a two weeks break and we'll be back on March 23rd after this episode. And uh, briefly, if you don't know who, what we do at Revit Pure, we have a learning website at revitpure.com. You can have a look at the blog to see all our guides. And we also have uh, courses, learning packages, three of them. One is called Manage for intermediate to advanced users that want to become BIM managers. Another one for people that want to use Revit for design and presentation purpose. And finally, a course for beginners called Basics. So you can have a look and have a preview of the courses at learn.revitpure.com. All right, all right. So today's guest is Randall Stevens. Uh, Randall has been the CEO of Avail since 2016. He is based in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, he's also a part-time instructor at the Business and Economics University of Kentucky since 2015. He is involved with the Building Content Summit since 2015 as, as well. And he, he was the founder and chairman at Arch Vision since uh, 91. I hope all the information was correct. So hello, Randall. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Nick? Thanks for I'm having doing me. Doing great. <laughs> yes. All right. So all that information uh, was correct. And I think perhaps we, we could start from there. You started Arch Vision. Can you explain what uh, Arch, Vision, Arch Vision is for people who might not know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, and prior to that, I, I studied architecture in school. So I, I say, uh, you know, I... Uh, I have the design background and the degree, mm -hmm. but I never practiced because uh, as soon as I graduated in 1991, I started a company called ArcVision. And uh, it started as a services company. So if you go back to the late 80s when I was in architecture school, I had the interest in the computing side. And so I was, of course, doing 3D modeling, you know, when it was hard uh, <laughs> uh, back in the late 80s and visualization and graphics, you know, became the kind of lure for me. Um, with what was going on. So uh, when I started ArcVision, it was really a services company. So, you know, today what uh, the outsourced companies that are doing high-end visualization, you know, I was doing what would have been considered high-end back in 1991. Uh, I, I was probably smart enough to know to get out of the business uh, uh, of competing against people that were really, really good at it uh, by the late 90s. And uh, mm -hmm. during that time, uh, ArcVision shifted um, to, to, to become a software company. And so 1998, we launched uh, uh, the RPC, which was the 3D, you know, putting people primarily and, and trees and foliage, you know, back in the late 90s and early 2000s was really graphics intensive. And so we came up with some solutions and strategies around that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that took off. So the, the software side of the business uh, grew and, um, you know, that technology is still alive. I, I uh, 
So we can talk about how we transitioned to Avail, but a guy named Corey Rubidoux, who basically developed all the uh, uh, V-Ray for SketchUp and, and Rhino and, and all the Revit, the AEC side of the business, uh, Corey went to work for Chaos, um, sold part of that all that mm -hmm. technology to Chaos that he had developed. And then uh, he came off the Chaos project in 2017, and uh, he's been he's been the CEO of ArcVision since then. So he's kind of taking it through a new yeah, renaissance of what we're doing with all that technology there too. So we call ourselves sister companies. We actually spun, we started developing uh, what became Avail was actually developed at ArcVision. And um, after that kind of got its own uh, legs, uh, in 2016, we spun it out into a separate company and I've been running Avail since then. Oh, interesting. So Avail started kind of as a, a side project or part of the Artvision uh, portfolio, but then move on its own. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the it makes sense after you after you think about it. And, and part of the story of Avail is that uh, my claim is that every software company well, I'll, let me back up from it and, and give you the kind of 50,000 foot view. In the AEC industry, all, of, all, everybody, all firms, all companies are services businesses. And their job, everybody's job every day is to take knowledge and encode it. And it's usually passed to somebody else through a piece of software, Revit, something they're doing in Revit or in Excel or in a PDF document, you know, somewhere it's, it's being captured, work's being done, and it's being put into a piece of software and then files are being produced. So when you think of it right, that abstractly, uh, every company that builds software ends up building some semblance of content management because mm -hmm. you have to manage files. And mm -hmm. um, so we were obviously with the RPC technology at ArcVision, always kind of in the content business. So we were always building uh, tools to help manage that content, you know, especially if you had libraries of things like mm -hmm. asset libraries and things like that. So for us, it became a, you know, why are we all spending time building different content management? You know, uh, not sometimes not very good. <laughs> and then, uh, so what became a veil was this kind of recognition or, um, uh, you know, the thought that, really on behalf of the end users, rather than having to interact with a different piece of software for every application that you're using, why couldn't you have one application where mm -hmm. all of your content information is accessible? So that that was at the kind of core of, of, of why we started building Avail and because we were building these tools. So it became, for ArcVision, it was going to be another product. And after we kind of got it started, started doing the development of it and, and found really fans, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use the word fans, people in the industry who were being supportive and telling us what the importance was and helping us kind of guide the early development of that. We saw that it was enough of, a, of its own mission, you know, I would say that that it should live on its own and be separated from what ArcVision's mission was. And so, you know, I was with uh, Corey, the CEO uh, uh, this week, uh, we're, we live in different cities, but I was with him earlier in the week. And you know, meeting with some people and it's like ArcVision is one of our main customers of Avail because mm -hmm. they they use Avail to help manage and mm -hmm. deliver content as well as other partners that we're bringing in as well. And then most of our customers are managing all of their own content uh, in Avail, but uh, but it was always designed to, to mux or bring together all this content from all over the place and make it easier for the end user to be able to find and mm -hmm. use and, and not have to go to a different interface or a different system and learn it every time. You know, one, you know, I, I can, I can be mouthy and I'll, I'll let you <laughs> ask questions, but you know, one way to think about this is, and I know you said we might want to talk about manufacturer content, but when you think about like going to a website for content, whether that's mm -hmm. an aggregator of content or a manufacturer's website, if you think about that, those are just content management systems and that every time you go to a different website, you basically are presented with a different interface. So you can mm -hmm. think about why it's frustrating to find content because it's not standardized of how to find content. So yeah, good uh, point. And, yeah. And get to that information. So that that's kind of the premise or the lens that we kind of look through uh, of mm -hmm. what the what the big problem is in the industry and why we set out with what we're doing with Avail.
Yeah, well, I guess we'll talk a lot about uh, content management in, in Revit during this, uh, uh, this session. But yeah, a veil from what I've seen, it's, it, it's for, uh, compatible with a lot of software and can work on its own as well, right? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, my, my story, which I'm sure I'll repeat plenty of the uh, things that I, that I kind of uh, say in telling this story. We made a couple of decisions early. The mission was to try to, we, we describe it as, as inside of a firm, but you'd really rather have instead of individual pieces of software managing content information, that we'd like to have a horizontal, uh, you know, a piece of software that, that works horizontally across the firm. In other words, supports all the content. So early decisions were everything that we do in Avail has nothing to do with a specific piece of software. We're able to build very specialized things, which we'll talk about here on Revit, on top of what we do at the core of Avail, but at, at its core, it doesn't really know anything. It's at its core tackling search, you know, seeing, browsing, and searching for information and trying to do the best job we can do at that, creating new ways to think about organizing and, and managing and getting to information. And then we do very specialized things as needed for specific applications for specific kinds of content. So that was, uh, you know, er early in the decision about how we were going to develop the platform and what, uh, what we wanted people to be able to do with it. And then the other that was maybe a little, um, I don't want to say it was controversial, but, you know, when you go back to 2015, 2016, when we were developing this, you know, the cloud was the new thing. So everything was go to the cloud, you know, everything's a cloud. Cloud was the new shiny object. And um, we weren't, we were never anti-cloud. I had people say that, oh, you're anti-cloud. It was like, no, we're actually just pro letting customers decide where their data needs to live. So when you look at the way we've designed Avail, we do have our own cloud storage that customers can use, but we also let that content live and stay in lots of different places, which we think was is the new problem, which is content and information wants to live in lots of different places. And that's making where information is more complex. So at the core of Avail, it's not only content agnostic kind of content, as long as it's digital, you can, you can manage it in there. And then where that information actually resides is also supported. So it's a, it's a tough technology challenge for us to be able to do that. But it also is why Avail has been very popular with our the customers who have chosen to start using it because it lets them make IT choices and decisions about where information needs to live or, you know, some sometimes wants to live, sometimes needs to live. We have some mm -hmm. customers that have very um, secure information and that information has to stay in certain places. So yeah, our yeah, mission. Is I, I know that some some firms, for, uh, maybe government workers, for example, that might work on uh, sensible projects, don't like don't use the cloud at all. They don't use BIM 360. <laughs> everything is stored locally because of uh, security issues. Exactly. So, so we support both. We're not, we're not anti, we're, we, we just want to let, let customers choose where their content needs to live or they prefer it to live. And uh, we, our mission is to support that. And uh, all right. So, so uh, um, yeah, I think we, we should uh, show a veil first, having a look at the chat. There's somebody called Brian Payne that claimed that he's from Endor from the Ewok village. So, uh, salutations to Brian. Else, uh, other questions about Unify? I think we we'll, can talk about that later. But but first, yeah, uh, I guess most people in the audience are Revit users, perhaps intermediate to advanced users, some beginners as well, some BIM managers. So um, let's start from the, the viewpoint of Revit. What you've told me is that when you were the CEO of ArchVision, you got to talk to a lot of people who were telling uh, you their issues that were facing with managing content. And so what have you heard like specifically about Revit or about families and, and detail that uh, led you to think about solutions for this? Yeah, good, good question, Nick. Um, yeah, lots, lots of conversations over the years with customers, uh, you know, in the industry and, and what their challenges were around content and information. Um, you know, I, I think what I would say the first, the first enemy that we, that we set out to attack 
was was Windows file folders, right? When you think about the file systems that we all are using, and this this is also I'll, I'll go back to the cloud. Any place that you're putting information in a cloud storage, guess what the front end of it magically starts looking like? It's just some hierarchical file system where you've got folders again. So you know part of the challenge with library and asset management, information management in general, is that you know, I like to say that Windows File Explorer and file folders in general have served us relatively well for 40 years. We're all, you know, we, you were either born into it or we got to see it. And we've been using it, you know, for a long time. Um, so we've all kind of gotten used to the constraints and pains of that. And what's happened is, um, you know, as the volume of information that we're all creating and, and ultimately trying to consume uh, has increased dramatically, or exponentially, the amount of information, the constraints of that kind of hierarchical system break down pretty quickly. We all, we all know, you know, if I say, um, take a Revit example, if I've got a lighting fixture, uh, and, and I'll bet most of the people that are on the call that are inside of firms can attest to this, most of the firms, there's probably once a year, that the some committee gets together and says, "Oh, we need a better way to organize this stuff." And you come, you try to come up with a taxonomy or some structure or strategy of where stuff should go, so that people can know where to go and get it. One of the first problems that you can recognize with with uh, you know file folders in the traditional sense is that a file can only be in one place at one time. You know, sometimes you have assets that, depending on how you're thinking of it, right. Maybe you would rather have things organized not by Revit category, the category that the family is, but you'd like it by discipline. So a lot of our customers like to think about MEP versus uh, architectural or landscape or interiors or some other grouping that makes sense of content. The problem is if you take something like a light fixture, it is both electrical and architectural. So by the nature of like a system, like a, you know, trying to put a single file in one place, you're forced now that people, you're either going to make copies of the file, which creates its own problems, or people can't get to it in the logical way that they would think about wanting to get to it. So, uh, you know, lo long-winded way to say those constraints of trying to force what is a complex set of information and the way people think about that information is we use the word context a lot, right? At the core of a veil, the reality is that the way people think about getting to information changes depending on what they're doing. So that that right there is means you're at odds with the way people think with forcing it into one structure. So that's, you know, that's kind of high level of why that there's a problem uh, down there. So what we've done with a veil is let let break free that information so you can get to it in lots of different ways and search for it and find it. Um, so that was one of the big, uh, uh, you know, big kind of recognitions early on. The other, you know, the reality in a lot of firms, and it still is, it's what a lot of people are battling is that if you, if you, as good as your library of information is, you're always fighting people wanting to go back to where they either, we call it the stash, they either go to their own stash where they've tucked away some assets and they know where they are, right? This is all about having good context and knowing how to quickly get to something and get the work done. Or they go to old projects where they know that they've used it before. And we're doing some things to, to help to solve that problem around, you know, the way people think and search is like, hey, what was the door that I used in that project two years ago? So we're going to let people search for things that way, even though it may be coming out of the library. So those are those are the kinds of uh, fun. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a huge problem that I found as well. Like for the problem is that I found is the, the template, the Revit template is in continuous change, is always changing, always evolving, always getting yep. better. But then you start a project and you say, you remember, you know, that schedule or that door that we've made you know, like three years ago, we need to get that back. And then you bring it back, but it, the standards are not, not quite there. The versions might be different and it kind of it kind of messes up your model. So that's already a big problem of management. And to me as well, it's 
uh, with, with some firms I've been working with is the challenge of, well, what do you keep in your template? What do you keep in your Revit template? And what do you keep outside of it that you can load? Like all the basic families have to be there for sure. But then like what what is the... Like the rule of thumb is if it's used more than 50% of the time, but it should probably be in the template. If less than that, it should probably be outside of it. Then it depends on the size. But it's these kinds of questions I yep. ask myself a lot and mm -hmm. my clients as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, there's there's probably not a single answer, right? It's complicated exactly. enough that exactly, it, it, yeah. it's <laughs> conditional based on what people are doing of how they should approach it. But but you are hitting on another, you know, one of the things that we learned uh, early and that, that we saw our customers once they began adopting Avail, you know, prior to any kind of a content management system, the best way to manage content in Revit was to stuff your library into your template. <laughs> so, which created its own set of problems. You know, one, you can you can vote on, I'll, we'll let your users vote on whether they think that the interface inside of Revit is the best, you know, for finding and searching and getting to that information. But uh, the reality is, is that most, um, when you think about a Revit file, an, an RVT file that's your project, that, that RVT file hosts uh, the, the, the model that you're working on and obviously your, your design documents and your documentation that you're creating in there, but it also then houses the library. So you have assets like families that haven't been used in the model and that, you know, it supports that stuff living in there. But what happens is your, your RVT project file starts off day one bloated and everybody's always fighting project bloat and data bloat. So, you know, when you think of it in that way, it was really antithetical to say, well, we should just shove everything that you could want to use into the template and load that and start with hundreds of megabytes of data maybe in there and let people fight through that information in order and, and to build the project out. So what a lot of our customers began doing was rethinking that strategically and saying, well, we'd really rather, ideally, your templates should be reduced to graphic standards, especially if you're a firm that has uh, maybe multiple project types where you need to start with different templates. You could reduce the templates down to the graphic standards, what you want your sheet setups to be, line types, line weights, all of those kinds of settings. Use your templates to do that. Offload the, the, the content, per se, outside of the, of the project file. And then begin a, a, an additive process of bringing information in only when it's needed. So um, that we we have most of our customers, I would say that that's you know been their strategy: thin out the templates, organize, get the information out into a system that makes it mm -hmm. easier to find and search, and then let them you know all the way down to you know I can show you an avail, all the way down to even when you load a family you don't have to load all of the types. You can load the single type that you're trying mm -hmm. to use. Again, you're always fighting data, data uh, bloat inside mm -hmm. of the project. So it, it's a it's a means of, of trying to keep better control of that. So. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, pro, the reason people were stuffing the templates is the Revit user interface and the way you load families, it, it's not very fun to use. And you have like the type catalogs and stuff like that, but still it's not visual. And like Autodesk added their uh, cloud platform where you can download families, but it's only for Autodesk families. You cannot use it for your own families. And uh, yeah, yep. so that's uh, a big flaw. I think we could show uh, we could yeah, show a veil on the screen. So now we can see your screen. I think people would like to uh, have a little overview, and you yeah. can keep explaining uh while uh while yeah i'll give you a, I'll, I'll happy to give you just a quick tour and yeah. we, we can dive as deep as you want um so this is what we call the avail desktop so we have several pieces of software our strategy was to always have a an interface you can think about this as replacing windows file explorer so it's the general interface to be able to handle any data and then we also developed what we call browsers that that reside basically as plugins inside of specific applications. So we have browsers for Revit, any AutoCAD-based product like Civil 3D or Plant 3D or AutoCAD, 
Uh, we actually have a new MicroStation integration, Rhino, SketchUp, 3ds Max. So we have interfaces that let content be consumed, and I'll show you that here in a second. But this desktop app also, uh, you know, acts as a standalone application. And I always start with it minimized, and then I go full screen just to get full. Uh, uh, but as you'll see, you know, and I tend to, if you, I'm sure I've been talking with my hands this whole time, and I. Whenever I'm on my uh, computer, I talk with the mouse too. So I'm usually <laughs> moving around, uh, scaling things and just uh, keeping things moving. But uh, very, you know, we one thing that, that I would, that I take pride in and I'll speak for the team here. One, our engineering team, uh, you know, more than half of our engineers have architecture backgrounds. So we, and computer science backgrounds. So we, we put together a great team that is, I'll say, understands and is very sympathetic with the design team, the world, and are good. We, we, we're very visual people, so. Um, yeah, so I, th I think that that shows. You can spot pretty quickly when a kind of plugin or tool is made by people who are not architects or don't have uh, a design background at all. Yeah, and, you, and, and, and the antithesis is you can always tell an application that was designed by an engineer. Not that yeah. they weren't good engineers, but they usually tend to not, you know. Mm -hmm. So we've, we're have we putting a lot of emphasis around a couple of things, keeping it simple so that people will use it, which is hard in itself, right? Especially as you, as you grow capabilities and features, keeping it simple is the hardest thing. And this is actually what I'm showing you is the fourth generation of our technology. And this 4.0, when the 4.0 release came out, my testament testament to it being successful was it actually got more powerful, but actually got felt simpler. And, and so we're always trying to figure out how to simplify things as part of the design process. But we use a um, we use a metaphor of channels for organizing, you know, uh, information in a veil. You know, you can uh, the 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 nice thing about it. Uh, we're actually doing some work. I was in a meeting this morning where we're when you actually start a veil, it's a blank slate. So it's like it's up to you to kind of mold it to what you want to do with it, what you want to put in there, which has its own challenges from somebody that doesn't know what it's supposed to do to kind of open it up and start using it. But um, but it's literally a blank slate. I tend to because we use this to demo with. I tend to want to show a lot of different kinds of content. Um, but these are, uh, these are what we call channels. This is what we call the home screen, but you can see here, if I go into say a Revit, uh, library, I just double click and what I'm going to see, you know, there's, uh, probably 3,000, 3,382, you know, families or pieces of content that are part of this. I can scroll through here, but if a couple of things, you know, this filters panel can be. Uh, can be minimized, but we pick up a lot of information and metadata and tags, which is what makes it searchable and what we call filterable. You know, so if I knew I was looking for casework and I just click on that in the filters, you know, I'm filtering down to that. So you could think about that in terms of that could have been, you know, casework, uh, you know, folder with a, you know, subfolder, right, uh, that, that, that I went into. The thing that you can't do, this is a great example Sometimes the way you want to think about a family is I'm looking for a wall hosted family. <laughs> so you would never, unless you were probably crazy, <laughs> think about how to build folders to have wall hosted versus non wall hosted families. But that's something that people think about, right? Um, so, you know, that's a great example of being able to slice through this information. You know, I could say, yeah, I want a, you know, I need a floor hosted family. There's a, a, a map, right, that, that's floor hosted. So I'm able to search through, cut through this database of thousands of files based on different criteria. And that's a, to me, that's a group, that's an example of the way people get to a piece of information can be different depending on, you know, what they're thinking about at that moment. And, and, the, and tomorrow they may come back and need to be able to get to the same information, but they're thinking about it in a different way. So mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. that's, that's why these, uh, you know, why this is uh, so important to be able to do this. So, yeah. So you mentioned earlier about the Windows uh, folder system and it's true that with a folder, you cannot, a file can be in a single subfolder. 
you know, you cannot play. It's going to be in the wall hosted family folder and then the case work folder at the same time. Exactly. And, right. and unless you go into some sort of a subfolder hell that is unmanageable. Exactly. So, you know, the, the beauty of this is if I go to any one of these uh, files and right click and say open the location, popped up my Windows Explorer over here. The reality is this, this is the out of the box Revit content. So it is living in those folders. We've just, we, we call it indexing. We index the content, we point to it, but in the interface of avail, it's freeing up the way that you can get to that information and see it. You don't really have to worry about where that is in the file system or in the cloud uh, in order for this to work. So. Um, you know, and you can you can get to content with a combination of uh, of searches, you know, search terms. So if I were to type in the word door, uh, I'm going to get search results. I get 134 results, but we also drop out the irrelevant information in this filters panel. So now all of a sudden it's like, well, I can, you know, am I looking for casework that has the word door in it or doors category that have doors in it? Well, it might be casework and here's door and I'm looking for, you know, wall cabinets or something, right? Um, so multiple ways to think about, you know, filtering down. We, we refer to, in general, the way we approach search or finding information is, uh, we call it progressive search. So it's, it's probably, a, if you've got a lot of information or a lot of content, it's probably not a reality to think that you're ever gonna type in one thing and get right to the thing. <laughs> so it's really a matter of if I type in something, can I narrow the scope and bring that back to you and show you a narrowed scope, but also bring back more information. So for instance, if I go back out to home and I type in the word door, I'm now searching across all of those different channels I have. And I see all this information, but across the top, I'm telling you which channels I found that information in. So this acts as another form of filters. So it's like, well, you know, there's my Revit 2020, but I've got texture libraries that have the word door in it, right? And uh, so this is this is why we call it progressive search. It's we we think that the 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 work that we have to do is to to have enough knowledge and information around the content so that when you tell me what you're looking for. I can bring back enough information to help you, you know, narrow it within a couple of clicks to find mm -hmm. what you're looking for. And use there, there are a, a couple of good questions already. Yeah. Uh, one from Dylan who asks, can the content metadata be searchable as part of a Vail database? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so if I go back to this Revit example, um, so we pick up information. In fact, let me show you. So here's uh, tags and metadata that I'm showing you. We have a tag and filters editor. If you look down here below, I'm actually not showing some information, things like Omniclass. Um, so you can tell Avail um, that you want to pick up any shared parameter, any information that you think is useful out of those files can show up. So you know, here's an example where I've got Omniclass information that was coming out of those families. So here's, um, yeah, Revit version. Uh, this is this is some of our demo content. So people probably been, uh, uh, you know, adding some things in here. But if, you know, if I were to say sliding door and search for sliding, you know, it's going to pick up on that Omniclass information as part of that search. And uh, here you can see Omniclass sliding doors, right, was, was a piece of the information that came. So, um, so the answer is yes, we can pick up any of that metadata. Uh, we do that, not, uh, I'll get a little bit technical, but we have plugin architecture for how to pick up metadata off different files. So we do this off Revit and we can pick data out of the Revit files, but we're also doing that in general for things like photos for EXIF information, or we're actually working on uh, deeper uh, into the AutoCAD and MicroStation world. So we're actually doing things around cell libraries and, and block, uh, you know, library management. Uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, we're heavy into Revit and, and most of our customers are heavy into Revit, but there's still a lot of people, especially in the engineering side of the world, using engineer, you know, using AutoCAD based products and, and uh, MicroStation uh, kinds of based products. So we're, we're doing the same kind of approach, being able to pick information, you know, out of those file types uh, through the, through this and, and add it as metadata. So, 
All right, so uh, more qu good questions. Another one from Matt McDonnell, who asks, is that criteria for family filtering manually inputted or does Avail automatically apply those tags from Rivet metadata? All automatic. So um, I'll say three, three main ways. In fact, everything that I'm showing you, there was probably little, I'll just say we're lazy. So there's very little of this that was probably manually put into the system. So our goal is first, can we get data out of the file? So in the, in the example of the Revit parameters, you may say Omda class is an important piece of information that we want to put out. You may have shared parameters that you're putting in. You say, I want that data to come out. So we let you define that and we automatically pull that. It's our, it comes in struct, what we call structured. So it's we store our tags as key value pairs and that metadata is key value pairs. So much like a parameter would be stored in Revit, we store our data in Avail the very same way. Uh, so that's the first main way is to try to get that data out. The second thing that we do, um, which is very uh, useful is we pick up, if those files are sitting in a file system, we pick up the folder names as tags and metadata. A lot of times that comes in unstructured. So I'll give you an example, you know, where I said casework. Well, this is actually the Revit category. So these families are actually casework families. And that we picked that information up as it was added into the system. But if you look below here at keyword, base cabinets, countertops, tall cabinets, and wall cabinets, those are just file folder names. So if I go back and say, open the location of that file, this again is the out of the box. We picked up that metadata as tags because it was useful. You know, the way, the way I would always describe it is you tried your best to organize this stuff with folder names. Why wouldn't we pick up that information and add it, right, as, as, one, as an important mm -hmm. piece of our, an important tag onto the system? And then, of course, so that's the second way that data gets in here and can be very useful. And the third way is that you can always, you know, add your own tags if you wanted to tag something. So, and then actually I'll use this as an opportunity to talk about a new feature that we just introduced called Tag IO. So if you, um, from a technical standpoint, this is important because we're building a plugin architecture for Avail. So we're actually gonna start being able to, to do very specialized plugins that do things on top of the content. And the first one that we've released is called Tag IO. And what this lets you do is actually take this information and metadata and download it and put it in a spreadsheet so that you can now use something like Excel or uh, Google Sheets and, and add information in a spreadsheet or remove or edit and change information and push that right back into the system. So that's a form of manually doing it, but using tools like a, you know, a spreadsheet or something to, uh, uh, so here it lets me you know, save this data out and if I were to, let's see if I can, uh, I can show you real quick. If I were to bring this into something like Google Sheets, let me do that. So I'm just gonna take that Revit file. So while, while I'm waiting for that to load and show you, it's uh, when we first released this, one of our customers, uh, literally within a day or two of it being out, you know, contacted us. And he was like, oh my gosh, this was incredible. I added, I'm going to make this up, but it was something like, I added 2,600 new tags to <laughs> 900 different details in our library in like a half hour, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You no know, money, you know. Uh, putting tons of data in there. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, while that's loading, also something I should show, I've realized I I didn't earlier. Let me, yeah, if you go, there's um, people at Avail create a spe special URL. It's resources.getavail.com slash Revit Pure. It's the first link in the video description as well. And there are a couple of offers uh, you can use, uh, but this one you get uh, three months free for all the live podcast listeners. So I think if I understood correctly, it's only during this live session. So if you're watching the replay, it might not work, but you can still access the 
um, 50 percent off on three months anyway you can have a look at all the available offer but the, right now if you're currently watching you can get this one at resources.getavail.com slash revit peer i'm sure there are some people watching that um can't wait to have a look yeah thanks nick so here's uh, if you can still see my screen you know here's i'm using google sheets uh I don't have Excel in this machine, but you can see that we or we bring push this data out. So every column is a key. There's all the content, right? There's the path of where the content is. There's the name of the file, what kind of file extension it is. There's its unique identifier inside of a veil that we use to match the data back up. But if I wanted to come through here, you know, I could use all the tools that I can use in my Excel spreadsheet. Or, you know, if I wanted to add a new you know, column, you know, a new key, I could say, you know, um, you know, this is my discipline. So I'm going to be able to have people organize this. And I could say, you know, I'm going to have architecture and I'm going to make all these files be architecture, but these are, you know, MEP. And if you wanted some to be both, you could say, you just separate it. And uh, I could import this right back I won't do it just for sake, but I could load it right back in and the data is right back into the system. So um, we're not currently doing anything to like inject that data back into the actual Revit file. But this is why this plugin architecture is going to get interesting because you could imagine we're, we're right there where it's like, oh, I'd really rather push these and mm -hmm. update those parameters back in the file itself. So we are doing a bunch of work right now on the back end with integrating this with Forge and, mm -hmm. and BIM 360, all the cloud services. So you can mm -hmm. imagine us being able to start to automate. We've got some customers that are that are really looking at at fully automating some of their building and processing of this stuff using these interfaces to be able to do that. So, so exciting stuff. Uh, I have a lot of questions. There's also a okay. lot of questions on the chat. <laughs> Good, I like uh, that. Yeah, a, a quick one. Can you search by version, for example, Revit 2021? Sure. Yeah, it's just another piece of metadata, right? Uh -huh. So I had... so easy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I, well, I'll just put in 2021, see what I get here. I'm not even sure if I've got any 2021 libraries. Yeah. But if I did, <laughs> okay. If I yeah, did. but you can do it. I think we could take take another yeah. the one then. Uh, can you? Uh, how do you deal with a type catalog? In, because in Revit, you have that point .txt file that contains uh, data like if uh, for types that you have uh, a lot of them. Yep. Uh, and so the question is, uh, will those type catalogs built into the content itself or will it just have separate text file and you have manually load them? Great question. So let me, uh, what I hadn't shown you was Revit in context with this yet. So let me use this to show you. Let me see if I can dock this. There we go. So I always call this being... Uh, pixel constrained because I'm trying to cram everything onto one screen. But um, so here's here's a veil desktop and I'll show you, we've got a browser. So you, we're really trying to, you know, um, I don't wanna get too wonky with this, but I, my, my I, what I'm pushing for and that I think the future is, is that you don't need these browsers inside of these applications. Most people work, have two monitors. They're gonna have their primary application on one. And the idea that you're going to open up like a veil or some interface to get to this information, or the other, and you're, and you're dragging and dropping information. So to me, it's just semantics about whether it's a plugin that's in there or it's this desktop app. To me, it's really about pixels. How many pixels are you going to give me to do what you're wanting us to do? So I think of it a little more abstractly uh, like that, but I'm going to use this as an example and show you that if I were to, uh, you know, if I go back to that door example, and I'm searching for a door, these, some of these doors, especially these commercial ones, let me show you, um, have external type catalogs. So um, you'll notice that in the, uh, in the content management interface, you don't have to see that for it to be present. What I'm gonna do is show you, I'm gonna open up inside of Revit. This is what our browser looks like. So. What this is doing is showing you more information, the, you know, the deep kind of information about that piece of content. So you can see here, there's the door. That door family only has this one main type, and there's an external type catalog. And we tell you that, that, that these types are coming out of a catalog. So we kind of handle that and manage it without having to show you the types. They're there. They're just, the catalogs are there. They're just hidden. 
And when you, if you've got external type catalogs available, recognize that when you bring the families in and takes care of marrying it all up automatically. So we keep the, type, the actual type catalog out of people's face. <laughs> they don't have to worry about it, but we pull the information forward. So, and this is a good example where, you know, if, if I was wanting to load this door, you know, typically somebody, if this was Windows file folders, they would just drag that RFA over into the project. And then you're going to have to, and then you're loading, right? Whatever families, or you've got to make multiple steps now to go change out which type you want. With this interface, we're actually going to be doing some changes to the workflow that I could talk about. But, you know, this is the idea that, hey, if I know that this is the family that I want, uh, you know, the, the type that I want to use, I can just drag over into this and Avail is going to load just that single type. You can see that little check mark next to the type and then put me in placement mode. So the only thing that came into this project, you know, if I now get out of placement mode, the only thing that came into this project, if I found that door, I think it was that one, right? Was that single type. So that that's back to what we were talking about earlier. Why bulk load a bunch of data into your project if it's not being used or not needed? And uh, so these interfaces are what allow people to kind of take this additive approach. You can also, we support multi-select. Uh, so if I wanted to bulk load uh, this, I can load all of those into the project now. In fact, I can go uh, and bulk load multiple families into the project if I want to uh, uh, as well. So we support a bunch of different workflows about what it means to you know, bulk load all of these families. So when you think about like people thinning out their templates, a lot of our customers will create channels that might be around a project type and the startup of a project type and the content that's in that channel is meant to be brought in at the start of a project, right? And you can just bulk load that in to start up the project and everybody's off and running, so. Yeah, exactly. So, which means that, you know, the idea of uh, putting more families than you need in a template becomes ridiculous yep. when you have a, a platform like this. Uh, there are a lot more questions, but I do, um, I think that we could, we need to talk about the fact that we, so we've shown loadable families in Revit, but lo loadable families are a small part of the content we use. Then there's details, drafting views, legends, schedules, uh, system families. Can you talk about how a veil can be used for that as well? Yeah, I'll show you. Um, so we, uh, um, I like I lo one of the things I like to say is managing families is the easy part. <laughs> it's everything that's not a family in Revit that gets really difficult. So what I mean by that is what you just listed off sheets, schedules, legends, system families, drafting views, uh, schedules, that's all content as well. And uh, as I don't have to tell anybody on this call that's using Revit, that all has to be stored in an RVT file, which is a project file, which means you can't drag and drop that on another project. It's gonna to try to open it as another project. So we, we took a deep dive and tackled this and uh, we have what we call harvest. You'll see a couple of these channels called where I have harvest. So I'm gonna go into this one channel and just show you these are what we call container libraries. So a lot of our customers will call them warehouses or container libraries, but basically I'm using an RVT project file to store a bunch of drafting views or a bunch of assets that need to be brought into another project. So everybody's probably used to, you have to go open that up as a separate project and you're kind of cutting and pasting or begging, borrowing and stealing from one project to the other project to get that data. Or you might be using the Revit project standards transfer to get the data over from one project file to the other. So what we've done is uh, we let, um, I can show you what the management interface, but the end result is what's important. So if I go to this channel, what you're gonna see are individual assets. But if you look down here in the filters panel, you know, I've got drafting views. So these get treated in a veil as individual objects, just like a family would be, that I can now drag and drop into a project. But the reality is that's coming out of an external, um, you know, RVT file, and it could be one or multiple RVT files. So if I were to do, let's just create a new sheet real quick. And I have, uh, you know, one of these details. First of all, let me go back to the desktop. I didn't show you, we have these really nice preview panel that lets you see, you know, again, the visual aspect of this is high resolution previews of this kind of content before 
you've had to open it up or to bring it into your project. Uh, but then the, uh, the kind of cool thing about this, this feature is I can find, let's just do a search, right? So I'm looking for a stair detail and I search for stair and there's my detail. I can literally just drag and drop this onto the sheet. <laughs> so what's happening behind the scenes is there's a detail that's sitting in an RVT project file, project file A, and I'm bringing it into my live project file B in one step and avail is basically the interface now between, between those two worlds. So there it is. It's in placement mode. I can bring and put that into the project. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, that brings me a lot of question actually. Yep. Um, and there was, hopefully other I questions. can answer them. If you get <laughs> at some, at some point you can get over my head in, in yeah, in, no, I, I think you will be able to, it, people were asking where the content is. So you, you mentioned that their default Revit family is where it kind of uh, locally, and since it's the typical path. But my, my question is, what part is in the cloud? And, and then in that case, he said it, it's, it's still in the Revit file, which means if you delete that Revit file, does it lose the link? Uh, so once, once you've brought the data into your project, it's in the project. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's dis literally disconnected. Figuratively, we know what came mm -hmm. into the project and where it came from. So we have the ability as we're developing future uh, tools, you can imagine us being able mm -hmm. to say, oh, that detail actually updated in the library. Would you like mm -hmm. to update it in your project mm -hmm. or not, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so there's, a, there's a connection there that we've got. We're marching forward with, you know, you can imagine the features that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of follow this. But, but once it's in your project, now that, that actual detail, right, if I found it up here, that drafting view is actually in, that, in this RVT file. So it's separated like it normally would be, no matter. We're using the very same methods to bring data in as you, as you would be using the Revit interfaces to bring data in. So we're not, there's no magic, uh, we're, you know, I don't think we're doing anything mainly because we have to use the Revit APIs to do it. So if, if you are not able to do it in Revit, it's hard for us to either figure out workarounds to do it, but we're, we're basically using the Revit APIs to be able to transfer this data. So anything that you could normally do like Revit project standards transfer. So like system family is a great example. You know, those have to be stored in your, you know, in an RVT file. Great example where you'd like to thin that template out as much as possible from a lot of those, you know, system families. Uh, but if I were to look for a wall type and decide that I wanted to, uh, you know, I can just grab that wall type and start modeling right in my, you know, live model with that, um, with one click. So here I am, right, able to start to bring, it'll, you know, it'll bark at you for whatever uh, it wants to tell you that you've got some kind of collision, but you can see I can start modeling with that system wall family, right? Yeah, I think like seeing that using system families was a kind of a big deal when I know you could do that because it's always an issue and the way you have to do it currently, let's say you're not using a veil, you have another container file with all the wall types and then you just copy and paste uh, the types you want, but it's kind of a drag and it's it's not a good way at all to do it. But you're, what you're saying is, uh, I guess my question is, uh, which data will be, is stored in the cloud then, if any? Um, so, um, yeah, good question. So, so the, the asset itself is obviously stored in the RBT file. Mm -hmm. When we run this harvest process on that, we're doing a couple of things. We're creating that visual that you see over here, right? So when I uh, clear this search, you know, and I, this drafting view is abstracted from the file itself. And this is what lets us do those high res previews. It makes this fast. It's completely separated. You're, you're now searching, viewing, and finding the asset you want. Is, is The data is separated from the actual file. So that's one of the things that makes Avail very special. We, we separate as much as we can so that we can be very fast uh, about what it means to search. We don't have to go get that data back out of the file in order to show it to you. So, so that this visual part of it is abstracted away. And then everything that I'm using to search by is metadata that's abstracted away and put into the database so that you can see and find it. And then what you're not seeing behind the scenes of this is we're storing metadata that references at an element level, what the element is inside of that RVT file that it's referencing. 
And then that's how we know to behind the scenes, we're opening that Revit file up using the Revit API. We're pulling that element out and we're bringing it into the current project for you. But you saw how kind of seamless that is. So for us, you know, I'll, I'll say for me and speaking for us, the magic of this was, wow, this really simplifies what it means for a user to search, find, and use a piece of content because we've reduced everything to, can I see it and can I drag it into my project? And, and it should be that simple. And that, that was our goal is can we, can we make it that simple? Yeah, I mean, I can think the amount of time that we're like, let's get that thing from that old project and then you have to update the Revit file and then it takes forever to load and then you have to find what you're looking for. You have to, to bring it. And if you use transfer project standard, you might bring a lot of things you don't need as well. So that, that's a pretty big, a big game changer, I would say. Yeah, this, this might be, this always impressed me, right? Is like, okay, I've got a sk standard schedule in my library that's, that I bring in. And here I bring it into this project and it's populated. So maybe it's just me that's impressed. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is the example. You want standardized content that you're supposed to be using, bring it in. Maybe your sheets were already set up with that when you brought in your standard sheets, but um, but you can see that all of that kind of data as it comes in, you know, populate, um, uh, do all those kinds of things. So. All right. So do you have a little more time for a couple more questions? Oh yeah, I've got tons of time. All right. I wanted, I wanted to tease out if we've got time, the mobile stuff too. I'll show you what we're doing on the mobile side. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, there was something uh, about the, the the coupon code as well. Just making sure I have that uh, while you're answering the, the question. Um, yeah. uh, somebody asked, pretty good question as well. Can you tra track user data, uploads and downloads and standards versus uh, project templates? Uh, definitely. So uh, one of the core features of Avail is a very deep, level of analytics information that's going on. So um, we call them transactions. So every every transaction that's happening is going into your own analytics data flow. We have a, I didn't have them set up to, uh, to show today, but uh, you know, a core set of, of standard dashboards. But the way we've set this up, you basically have control of your own data. So if you're using Tableau or Power BI or some other data analysis tool, you can also point it at that data and begin to see what's being used, what's not being used, what's being searched for, what you know was brought into us actually all the way down to a project level. We're doing, we're working on some new features around a little bit deeper integration on the project side of what's going on, and there'll be even more information uh, that you'll be able to get uh, as we release those features this year. But um, but yes, lots of deep, probably more data and analytics than you would know what to do with. So it's. Uh, one of the, the one of the more useful pieces of info that uh, that I think our customers can use is whenever somebody performs a search and avail at their desktop, if it didn't return any results, it's actually one of the more actionable pieces of information. So we have reports that tell you basically what do people search for that return zero results. Because if your job is to try to make sure that people get the information that they need, that's some of the first stuff that you want to look at is what are people looking for that they can't find basically and uh, a lot of this data and analytics helps you to kind of gu guide you around you know what 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 you might want to be working on so all right uh, a few more questions uh, um a question from Bruce Berry that asks how does avail migrate to each new version of revit um, I'm going to guess that they mean the content, uh, to, to each version, as opposed to like our software, obviously we release, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, software, you know, is always ready whenever the releases are, mm -hmm. uh, from the content side, um, you know, we, we have tools that help you do upgrades. There's obviously a lot of different ways that firms decide to do their, uh, uh, content library upgrades. Sometimes, Sometimes firms want to take an entire collection of content and say, when the new version comes out, I want to take that entire collection and move it over and convert it, uh, you know, up, upgrade it, make it available. Some firms, uh, customers I know like to say, let's use that occasion to get rid of some things that we don't want anymore and maybe add new things or kind of refresh that. So um, we obviously try to support whatever our customer's strategy is around that. Um, what I'll say about upgrading content, 
avail will also when you're using it in the context of revit if you if i'm in like i'm demoing in 2020 right here if i obviously i can't bring a piece of 2021 content into this project but if i had a piece of 2018 or 2019 content that showed up it'll actually upgrade that on the fly uh, in in the project session so that you're bringing that in uh, you know it's not it's not upgrading it on the network but it's uh but it but it lets the user you know use that piece of content and bring it in so all right um there was this, a question earlier from Alan Turing that asked, can you elaborate on what a channel is? I, I think you mentioned it. So it's, it might be a d different software or different kind of projects. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, I, the, you know, the analogy I use uh, with a channel and avail is think of it like a music playlist. If you, uh, you're in Spotify uh, 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 and wanted to create a music playlist, you create a playlist, you give it a name, and you decide what content you want in that playlist. So music's a good analogy because I could say, if I could have one playlist that are my favorites and the same song that is in my favorites could also be in another playlist that is, you know, 90s rock music. And the same, what you want is one version of, the, of that song, but it'd be able to be, you can get to it from two different directions. So if you think about channels in Avail, I can show you just real quick how easy this is. If I wanted to create a new channel, it's as easy as me. I have what we call publishing privileges in here. I can create a channel. I'm going to call it Randall's new channel. I can give it a pretty picture, but it's a blank slate and I can either begin adding content off the network or my drive or wherever into that. But I can also, if I go back to this Revit example, I can also copy content from one channel to another. So let's just, I'll just use this casework as the example. I may decide that I want all of this casework to not only be in my standard library, but I want, uh, I'm going to just select those and say add to channel. So now I can say go to that new Randall's new channel and I'm going to copy these. I'm not really copying the file, I'm just copying inference to that file into that channel. So now when I go to that new channel, I can see all that content. It's another way to get to that content, but it's the same file in the same place behind the scenes, right? So it's a way to keep from duplicating content, not having to have, but, but it's back to that example of, I wanna to get to this in different ways and organize it in different ways, but only maintain it once in one place, so. Good, so uh, behind the scene, uh... We're trying to figure it out. I think there was a, a coupon code. I'm trying to, to remember. I've been filtering to my email to, to find it. Uh, Jim Clifton is on, on it. So we'll have okay. shortly a, a coupon before the end of the session. So you can uh, access all the discount. Yeah, can I show this real quick? Nick? Yeah, yeah, go go ahead. So, yeah, you have so, more time, uh -huh. sure. So I'm using a little screen share. I'm actually on an iPad my personal ipad so hopefully uh, my mom doesn't uh, send me send me a crazy message while we're on here but we've been working on a mobile strategy and first thought is a head scratcher but i'm going to show you i'm going to launch uh avail oh let me broadcast so i just launched um let me minimize it again so i'm just launching an app these are the very same channels of information i was just showing you in the desktop and i'm now on my ipad or my iphone we also have um I, um we have both iOS and Android support, but these are the very same channels. So if I go back to like my uh, harvested channel that I was in before, very same content, but now you're, you're not at your desk. So let's say that I wanted to search for uh, that stair detail and I do a quick search for stair and come on. I told Nick, I like to live by the wire, but uh, you know, here's here's that stair detail. So again, I've got that now on my mobile device. I can actually zoom in and out. I can see that detail. Obviously, I'm not. I'm on my phone. I'm not going to do something in Revit. But what to think about is I can link share. So I could share this out now, say through Slack or Teams. So I'm going to go. Um, I've got a special channel that we link share into. Let me just show you this real quick. So I'm just pushing this to my, one of my co work colleagues. And if I go over here now, 
Let's hope I didn't kill that window. So here's Slack where I just pushed that. And I've got my available desktop here, but watch what happens. If I am now at my desk and my colleague is like working on this in Revit, there are the link I just shared. If I click on that link, it's actually going to bring me right to that piece of content at my desk and I can drag and drop that onto my Revit sheet right now. So, um, so we're, we've been working on mobile because we know that you know, there's people that are working in the technical applications, but there's PMs and people that, are, that aren't using the technical pieces of software that still need to see the information. So we're abstracting the information away, letting people see it, letting them uh, browse, search, share things, use these links to get to it. And uh, we're, we're kind of in beta testing with this now with uh, our customers, but uh, we think that there's a nice connection to, you know, we don't want everybody to have to work when they're not at their desk, but, you know, it also, you know, sometimes you need to be able to see something away from when you're away from the technical piece of software, the network, and you need to be able to see it and tell somebody else where it is. So. All right. So if you have time, still a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, one from uh, uh, Amira who asks, uh, can Randall elaborate on the difference between the free and the licensed version? Mm. Sure. So uh, we have a, we've, we've always had a free version of Avail. It's just limited to two channels. So you can create two channels for free. You can put, I think the limit is it's either 1500 pieces or 2000 pieces of content in each of those channels. And, and it's a way to install it, start seeing how it works. And, and you can actually even, I didn't show you, but you know, obviously one of the main features is you share, as you create these channels, you then decide who to share them with. So you can actually, even on the free version, you can share out with colleagues and they can see that. Our goal was obviously to give you enough of a taste of it to want you to, to use more and, and buy a licensed version, which then opens it up to an unlimited number of channels and how much content uh, that you want to put into the system. But, um, and then, you know, there are some other features of Avail. We have a thing called Stream, which is part of our enterprise offering that uh, automatically monitors networks for data and automatically keeps data synced and all kinds of things. Uh, so there are some other kind of features that are part of the paid uh, plans. Uh, but in general, it's it's pretty much it's pretty flat as far as that. Most of the pricing uh, discounts have to do with volume buying, not so much feature separation. But uh, um, but that's that's the primary difference is just how much content you can push into the system. Uh, great. Another one from um, uh, Kiliku who asks, uh, no, not, not that one. Uh, can this be combined with another cloud storage service such as Google Drive? Yes. In fact, um, I was just showing you real quick before I uh, forget about it. We have built-in viewers, so things like PDF documents, you can actually in in the application see that without... I can double-click and it would launch Bluebeam or whatever my PDF software, but we also just let you see and browse. It's back to, I want you to see as much as possible. Here's a great example. Um, this is a channel that I've got a bunch of Revit content, but if I go down here to where I've got this tag agnostic, so this content, you can see this content is in SharePoint. This is in Box. This is in Google Drive. This is in OneDrive. This one's on the network. This one's in Dropbox and this one's in Bin360. So you can have content in lots of different places and in Avail, it's all coming together, right? This is an extreme example, but I use it to demonstrate like, you can literally have content in all these different places. Right? But, but wait, is that little image that says I live in, is, is that added all over the image for the we example? Did, no, we just did that to, to demonstrate this graphic. I uh -huh. think, you know, in the, in the end, uh, my goal would be that people don't have to know that they shouldn't, yeah, as long as they, they can authenticate care. and have permission to get to that, it should, they shouldn't care where it is. Uh, obviously, as we, add these things to the interface you might want to know what source that's coming out of and uh we can you, know, you can always uh, for any piece of content if i go down to this information you can see uh you know here this is coming out of box sync okay, yeah you can actually see where it is um we're doing we're we're making some you know always always trying to improve you know what what information do you see and 
what do you need to see right now? This, this is where I said earlier, it's hard to be simple. The simpler you make this, the harder it is because people want, they of course ask for more and more info, but you can imagine, you've seen plenty of interfaces where it's like you get over, over informed. So our, our challenge design challenges, can we, you know, what do you need? What's primary? What's secondary? How do we design interfaces that let you get to that when you need to get it, still make it simple to do, to use. Um, so that's the cross that we bear. Yeah. All right. So uh, good news, uh, Jim from Avail publish the, the code. It's uh, Revit Pure Monthly 100. So let me put that in big somewhere. Just a minute. I'm, I'm glad he could do that because I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. Yeah, me neither. I don't remember if I had it. So just a little moment here. All right, so let me share my screen. So Revit Pure Monthly 100, if you go to that URL I posted earlier in the chat, which is resources.avail.com slash Revit Pure, and you can see all the offers and you can put in the code uh, I've just said to uh, claim the special deal and uh, try Avail by yourself. Like, yeah, so you've been uh, kind enough to share a license for the last few months, but I, I've learned a lot more and it's uh, <laughs> it's nice to get uh, uh, all the explanations as well. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just uh, for for uh, for the listeners that are on the show, obviously, you can get this downloaded, start, you know, everybody always wants to, you know, let me touch it. Let me and we wanted to make sure that people did that and we didn't want to prohibit that. Um, but, uh, we also, we have a full customer success team where we, we do a lot of classroom training on these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can go to the website and sign up for one of our upcoming classes. If you really wanted to start to get trained and, and learn some of the more intricacies of it. And, uh, uh, Todd Trevisano uh, is our customer success manager. He and the team on that side run lots of training webinars. There's also, um, there's a learning channel, um, and that learning channel has lots of YouTube videos. In fact, this is all searchable. Of course, it's a content management system. So it's like, if you want to understand more about Harvest, you can look for a video on Harvest. You can actually open this window up. This content's hosted in YouTube, but again, Avail's job is to let content live where it lives, but be consumed in these interfaces. So you can see we're able to, you know, you can just open this up and click play and watch a tutorial on these types of things. So. Um, you know, we try, <laughs> we're just trying to make it as easy as possible and, and helpful. So, yeah, like I'm starting to think I need something like this for all my files on windows, <laughs> not just the, the files, the BIM files, all of them. Yeah. One of the fun things that we did, I'll just use this as kind of the last example. You can actually index URLs into avail mm -hmm. that could be an internet site or external website. And you really, one of our customers was kind of pointed us to this. They were indexing like, manufacturers websites mm -hmm. right that they go to a lot so you know again if i open up my preview panel this is actually you know this is a live rendered uh, you know deep link uh you know to 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 uh, content and, and web urls so you know you can and if i double click it'll just launch my external browser to that you know to that site but uh you can think about using it for a lot of organizing your digital kind of digital world of content right and uh we, 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 when we talk about content, it's not just Revit content. We think about, we look at the whole world as digital content. <laughs> and it's like, mm -hmm. where is all this information and what is the challenge to get it connected and back to you, you know, right, in a logical, uh, meaningful way. So we've kind of taken on a, a big mission of, of, of the complexity of the information in this industry that's trying to be wrangled and, and, and managed and, and that yeah, our users, a right. It's a, it's a, it's amazing when you really dig into it, how people get their work done, because it is so complicated of where all this stuff is, right? I mean, yeah, subfolder hell, as I mentioned earlier, like you go in the folder, another one, another one, another one. And then you, by the time you get there, you forget what you were looking for <laughs> at the beginning. Exactly. exactly. And yeah, like just creating Reddit <laughs> learning content, you know, all tutorials, it's so many images and InDesign files, Photoshop, Illustrator, and uh, video tutorials, narration files. 
like almost thinking I should use something like it. Sure. <laughs> I, I might try it. Might be interesting. <clears throat> give it a try. Give us some feedback. And uh, yeah, you can. It's it's. I'll tell you when when we first started developing it. You know, we're we're you know we're, we're a software company, so we're developing the software. And there's always the question of, do you even use your own software? And where I where I drank where I started understanding was actually our marketing content. It was like the all of our marketing material that sat out on the network over years was you know a huge volume of a voluminous information. And I indexed the entire thing into a channel of avail and it became immediately like, okay, it's all searchable now. I never have to go back to those folders again. Right. And that mm -hmm. I, I've never have. <laughs> yeah, that that's pretty smart. Just looking to see uh yeah, let's go with the last question. Uh, does the only the person creating the channel need need a license? I think to well, once you get to a, a paid service, I guess all the users have to be you know, on the paid license, right? That's correct. Each mm -hmm. our, our business model is each user there's a, a user level license fee. So you can you can with the free version you can test out sharing to somebody the the free channels that you've done and they can consume it. You can't um, in in the paid version you can actually elevate people to have editing privileges. There's all kinds of more controls that happen there. In the free version, you're limited when you share it to somebody, they can only consume, but it lets them start to understand that experience. And then, um, and then ultimately, yeah, if you go into a paid plan, each user has to have a license. Yeah. All right. We, we like to think it's reasonably priced. So we've tried to, you know, we try to keep it. Yes. Yeah, so it's basically $20 per user per month. Yeah. Like roughly. You, Depending and, on the or, amount of users. And or if you pay annually, it's $200, uh, you know, so less than $20 mm -hmm. a month. It's, you know, 50, 50, whatever that is, $16, $17 a month uh, a user. So, uh, you know, a lot of times in firms, you know, the, the challenge for us has always been the, the ROI, if you wanted to measure mm -hmm. the return on the investment is how long did it take me to search, find it, a waste spending, or, you know, even worse than the time spent to find it. What if you couldn't find it, knew it existed, and then spent time recreating it? So it's mm -hmm. like all that time, we've just never had a good measure of it. But it's pretty safe to say most people say, yeah, we, we all do it, right? Probably an hour or two a week, if you, in aggregate, it might be 10 minutes here, 30 minutes there. Uh, but it adds up over time. So it's not, it's not a hard, um, you know, question to say over the course of a year. Yes. It seems like a no brainer. <laughs> it seems yeah, yeah. Like when it comes to the price, I know like the issue with any paid plugin I have with some of my clients is that they say, well, uh, Revit is so expensive already and you, you want us to have something else. So uh, sometimes that was a little convincing, but if you can prove the ROI, it's uh, yeah, it's a no brainer yeah. in this case. The, the best way to have a mindset is all of the software Revit included is relatively inexpensive to the person that's using it. So the question is, mm -hmm. how do you make that person more useful and, and what they're doing and what's coming out of their brain, right, is what's the most useful. So you want to minimize and let them do high value kinds of things, right? And that's uh, then all of a sudden it's like, OK, what is this person costing me an hour to, mm -hmm. to to, to do this kind of work and that's where yeah when, when you stop and think about it how many times do we lose just trying to find files find healthy healthy <laughs> mindset right getting and lost then, in, in some folder yeah I, I, a lot of people are mentioning that they're uh that they want to try it and uh, yeah i've already i personally already tried it and used it but now i think i'll expand it to uh, more files now that i have a more in-depth presentation yeah. And then, uh, you know, anybody that tries it, our team, we love to talk to people. As you can see, I'm a, I'm a talker and most of our team, we all uh, try to have, uh, you know, we, we, we're approachable. So if you have questions or, or anything like that, just reach out to our team and they'll set up a one-on-one -on -one call and help walk you through anything. And uh, have, we just try to always be as helpful as we can. So, All right. So uh, quickly... Uh, resources.getavail.com slash Revit Pure. You can use Revit Pure monthly 100. Let me uh, put that back in my screen. So Revit Pure monthly 100. That's the code you can use to claim the special deal on the URL. And the URL is also the first link in the description of this video. 
Um, all right, Randall. Well, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I've learned. I thought I knew a lot about Avail, but I've I've learned a lot, and it's nice to hear the philosophy behind it as well. And the the and <laughs> it's interesting that it goes all the way back to problem with Windows and things we've been uh, been used to for so long. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, you made the time fly by, and uh, mm -hmm. it's always fun to uh, to have these kinds of conversations. And the conversation is not over. You know, we, we there's really it's a it's a deep, tough problem, and uh, you know, we think we've assembled a great team trying to work on it. But it also we learn something every time we interact with our customers about what they're trying to do, what the real problems are. So we try to spend as much time with customers as possible, and. Hopefully it's reflected in 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 the software and, and helping us solve these problems. So appreciate having us on. All right. So quickly, uh, in in three weeks from now, uh, on March twenty third, an episode called the BIM at Big with Jens Majdal Karlsson, which is uh, formerly the BIM manager at Big, now the design technology leader, something like that. But um, Talking about how BIM and Revit are used at Big should be fascinating. Make sure to tune in. And for now, uh, thanks everybody in the chat. Lots of great questions as usual. Uh, thanks Avail and thanks uh, Randall. And make sure to get your trial. So see you, Randall. Goodbye. See thanks, you, everybody. Dave. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everybody.